Good morning, everyone. Well, good morning, everyone in Australia. Good evening, I think, to Sam, where you are in the Bay Area. I assume it's sort of pre-dinner time. So we're getting everyone at the very different uh, ends of, uh, of the day for this session. Can I please welcome everyone to the breakfast session of day two of the ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we proceed, I do want to acknowledge and thank the traditional owners from where I join you today in Ngunnawal country. Uh, before we enter the discussion today, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping things. I'm sorry, I'm sure you've heard these so many times by now. Uh, if you do want to raise a question, please just put that in the chat, raise your hand either on screen or via Zoom. Uh, Samantha and I are going to, to have a chat basically for about uh, probably 15 minutes, depending on how much uh, we can eke out of our disagreements on things. And then we will open up to, uh, to questions from the floor. So if you have something that you want to in interject with, just keep that in mind and there'll be plenty of time to, uh, to question both of us, but uh, particularly Samantha, because she is very much the expert here. Uh, so I will introduce Samantha. She is uh, an expert, a very well published and very well cited expert uh, in disinformation and misinformation. She's based at the Stanford Internet um, Observatory and Digital City uh, Civil Society Lab. She writes on uh, technology and society, media, uh, foreign influence, and uh, I guess how we really wrangle with uh, the internet and social media in international relations and in uh, governing domestic politics. So I'm going to start by um, asking Sam a question that I think really gets to the core difference of how uh, different researchers view social media. I'm very so sorry to say to myself, um, I'm very much a, a domestic politics person. I look at elections. I look at how we can change voters' minds on things. Samantha is coming to this from very much uh, 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 the perspective of foreign influence. So from my perspective, social media doesn't matter, right? People, uh, if people have their political views and their political preferences formed so young that jumping onto Twitter or jumping onto Facebook shouldn't matter. That's the very sort of conservative domestic politics view. But Samantha, convince me why social media matters. Yeah, and Jill, thank you so much for that introduction. And hi, good morning, everyone in Australia. Um, yeah, it is a, a little before dinner here, so hopefully you don't hear my tummy grumbling <laughs> through through the microphone. Um, uh, that's such a such a great kind of question to kick us off. Is like, what is actually new and important here about social media? Because you know, Jill, I think you pointed out like people consume a wide variety of information from so many different sources. We're influenced by our friends. Uh, we're influenced by our families, and you know our political ideologies aren't something that, you know, we read one piece of news and all of a sudden we've changed our mind on an entire like contentious issue. It's something that happens slowly over time, uh, if at all. Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of really uh, the million dollar question here is like, what's actually new about social media and is social media, uh, has it disrupted our information landscape, our interpersonal relations enough to kind of affect these growing trends in in polarization. Um, and so there's a number of different um, theories and arguments out there around uh, the effect that social media can have on polarization. Um, the first, um, some of you might have heard of this term before, has to do with filter bubbles. Um, and so that's the idea that social media algorithms themselves, they're reinforcing a particular point of view, because we know that algorithms tend to personalize content, and they personalize content based on people's data, um, which will collect all kinds of information about like our political preferences, um, our various interests, interests, and make big, big inferences about who we are as people and who we are as voters. And then the algorithms will feed in um, that content that already pits our preferences to our news feeds. So we're continuously seeing, you know, either right leaning or left leaning content. That's kind of like the first theory around the way that social media might um, influence polarization. Because if you're only seeing content 
politically left or politically right. Um, you won't be exposed to those diverse viewpoints that help make democracy work and might, you know, challenge your own kind of biases and whatnot. Um, the second theory um, is that it's not actually the algorithms, but it's the way that social media structures group interactions. Um, and so this is the theory around echo chambers where I'm going to, I already have a group of friends that are particularly you know, politically leaning one way or another. I'm gonna follow those people. I'm going to interact with them. And um, I'm going to stay in this echo chamber where I'm not necessarily being exposed to other kinds of people with diversity diverse views around politics and therefore um, will polarize society that way because people are self-selecting into various groups. Um, and then the third kind of theory um, around social media and polarization has to do sort of again related to the algorithms, but the way that they promote certain kinds of content over others, not necessarily political, but um, this really has to do with the different kinds of polarization that we're, we're talking about as well, because there's ideological polarization, which has to do with, um, you know, we can't agree on political ideologies. And then there's affective polarization, which is the idea that I, you know, as one political ideology, don't like you as a person. Um, who has a different political ideology than me. And so that's affective polarization. Um, and this is where attention economics kind of come into play because algorithms might promote negative content. They might uh, promote conspiratorial content. They might promote content that um, is like very rumorous or slanderous. And that stuff tends to go viral and very far on social media. And so if we're constantly being exposed to the other side um, or people who are do not share our same political values as you know being negative and being bad, affective polarization might therefore increase. And so those are kind of three theories. And to be honest, Jill, I think a lot of the literature is very kind of. Uh, all, there are studies that will show both sides for all of these things. We don't necessarily have good answers as to, you know, this is exactly, you know, social media for sure is promoting echo chambers or is for sure promoting filter bubbles or is for sure, you know, feeding us this negative kind of content through attention economics that is leading directly to polarization. But these are kind of like the three theories that people tend to point to when we're thinking about, hey, what's actually new here about social media and how could this be changing how uh, we view other political ideologies and how we view uh, others. Let's talk a little bit more about effective polarization because I didn't know you were going to bring that up. And I love the theory of effective polarization. Well, I hate it from a democratic sense, but it's probably something that a lot of um, the audience hasn't really come across because it's a little bit inside baseball still. And it's this idea that we have a sense of identity about the, the party that we like or the, the social group that we identify with. So um, you know, I'm an academic and I'm a cricket fan and I live in Canberra and all of these things make up my identity. But effective polarization is a little bit more embittered. It's a little bit more angry and it taps into this idea that we don't just like our in-group, but we often hate the out-group. And while this can sound really kind of aggressive and confronting, it's not always, it's not always so much the case. Uh, it might just be that as much as I like to see my party win at an election, I also kind of like to see another party lose. And that's, in conventional political science, something that we thought didn't matter so much. There's the sort of the classic study of negative advertising and, and sort of emotional advertising in political science and election campaigns suggests that when people see too much of this kind of angry emotion from candidates or from political parties, they tune out. It might make us, it might sort of influence our vote, but most of what it does is make us less likely to care generally. But something about algorithms and social media feeds off this, right? And, and so you mentioned this in your last point, because I think this is one area where we can instinctively get the feel that social media does matter. We do see angrier content and we do see this more effective with an A um, content more than we see boring kind of long form headlines, you know, um, 
explainers or think pieces about um, Afghanistan, for instance. So what what role does the do the platforms have here? You know, are they are they really to blame in pushing this viral clickbaity effective kind of content? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it is definitely, you know, we can think of the, the new role of technology here and the role of the algorithms, um, because for sure, 100%, they are playing a role. At the end of the day, social media companies are businesses, and they are businesses that are built on attention economics and surveillance capitalism, where you take a whole bunch of data about people, uh, you feed it into your algorithm so that their people's attention stay on their screen longer so you're constantly scrolling on your phone um, and that time um, and in that time you can deliver advertisements to them or sell users data to other parties who want to advertise um, to to various users across the platforms and so there is an actual economic incentive for this kind of content to go viral um, that being said it's also because we as people tend to like this content um, you know people do like there are lots of studies out there that show that emotional content tends to go much further um, and much farther on the internet than plain old facts. Um, and you know, this doesn't always necessarily have to be negative emotions. Like if we think of cat videos or those like cute animal videos, like that's why they tend to get shared online a lot because they elicit a positive emotional response in people. And then people will there go, go on and share that kind of content. But negative emotions tend to have a much stronger effect on people. And so that's why they'll often go farther than some of the happier content that we see online. So, you know, part of it is for sure the social media platforms and you know, I don't want to kind of like absolve them of their like role in really um, promoting this kind of content, but you also can't take the human factor out of it as well. So you mentioned facts there and that gets us to our next point. Can you explain the difference between disinformation and misinformation? Because again, this is very inside baseball, but something that we get hung up on in the discipline. Um, and again, sort of bring it back to the role of, of platforms here in, in you know, uh, I guess, helping us to parse disinformation and misinformation as, you know, as humble kind of audiences. Yeah, so um, typically in the literature or, you know, in general, when we're thinking about misinformation, um, we're thinking about content that um, might be spread online that people might not necessarily know is false. Um, so there's like a question of intent behind the different uh, definitions of misinformation, disinformation. Misinformation, there's kind of like no ill intent to misinform people by sharing this kind of content. Whereas disinformation, there is some kind of intent to misinform people. And so we tend to talk about disinformation in the context of influence, foreign influence operations online, because you, know, you have a state back actor that is purposefully injecting certain kinds of false information um, into the social media ecosystem and trying to get other people then to pick that up and share it maybe as misinformation because they might not realize that it's actually true. And so it can kind of like change depending on the actual intent of the person. Uh, it makes it like really tricky definitely, definitionally because, you know, intent is something that's really, really hard to measure. Um, mm -hmm. But usually when we're talking about those two different terms, we're thinking really about like the intent behind the sender of the message. So, and again, you mentioned, um, so you mentioned state actors there, right? So we're, we're escalating very quickly from, from me sending around a meme that is a little bit wrong to, you know, to Russia trying to meddle with our elections. And I guess this is, this is a, again, a, a huge definitional problem when we're talking about this stuff, because we are talking about a, an enormous range of actors. And while, you know, attention may focus on Russia and, and Trump and whatever, but a lot of this is sort of happening down low. And that's, I guess, you know, the the kind of the, the feeling for a lot of us, I think that the horse has bolted. So how can I stop my auntie on Facebook from sharing anti-vax memes, but at the same time, you know, be worried about um, election integrity in um, in Afghanistan, for instance, you know, or, or some kind of um, state versus state, 
you know, conflict that's happening via Facebook. How does how does Facebook grapple with that as a company? Yeah, and you know, I think this is such a hard question where we constantly see the platforms really struggling to, um, you know, implement any kind of meaningful change to their algorithms, to their business models, to their systems, because it is a hard question. And you know, whenever we're dealing with anything that has to do with speech, there's a lot of interpretation. There's a lot of gray area. Um, and then we're not only working in one language, but you know, Facebook is a global company with you know billion users that are not only speaking English, but are speaking a lot of very localized dialects that are going to have different you know, terms for hate speech and um, so on and so forth. And so moderating all of that at scale is a huge undertaking um, that's full of all kinds of trade-offs. Um, so um, in terms of, you know, what the platforms can actually do about it, it's it's a very difficult question. And, you know, I think a lot of um, when we're thinking about mis and disinformation in particular, which so often can feed into polarization and this affective polarization, you know, um, it's, you know, the platforms play a role here, but, you know, we have to also think about citizens, we have to think about government responses, it's really like a challenge, you know, the fight for democracy is really something that we have to fight at all levels. Um, <laughs> so, a government's got, you know, if, and you know, this is a big if, I, I grant you that, but if, if there are state actors around the world looking at Russia, and you know, I guess being impressed by by their internet activities, you know, by these sort of labs of, of citizens that they have pumping out disinformation. Is there a way to put that genie back in the bottle? Probably not. <laughs> I think, you know, especially <laughs> given like how ubiquitous and how important social media is for news consumption, for entertainment, for, you know, interpersonal connections, for life, for everybody, really. Um, I think it's like going to be really hard to put that genie back, back into the box. Um, this is, you know, really one of the newest fronts for this kind of interference. And, you know, compared to traditional media, um, or like traditional kind of methods for spreading propaganda. It's so much cheaper. Um, you know, creating fake accounts is just incredibly like such a low cost. You know, you just mm -hmm. need a SIM card um, and, you know, a cheap mobile phone. Um, you know, uh, if we think about the data that you can collect about like how well your messages might be spreading and breaching certain kind of audiences, um, that kind of information is incredibly valuable to propagandists, right? Because you can do A-B testing. You can see which messages work with certain kinds of audiences. You couldn't do that in the past if you were dropping leaflets out of a plane, like during World War II or whatever. Uh, you wouldn't know who picked up your leaflet and why the message might have resonated with that person. With social media, we can do that. And, you know, we can target very specific communities of people um, with very fine-tuned interests because of all the data that there is about us. So it's not just kind of general um, sociodemographic information anymore. It's, you know, does this person like, um, does this person like guns or do they mm -hmm. um, like guns and live in the South and are between certain ages and like so on and so forth. You can pull in so many different kinds of factors. Um, and because we have so much data about people, you can do these kind of like big data analysis looking for various trends across these communities to really tailor that message. And so all this to really like say kind of, you know, people who are spreading disinformation purposefully um, and using social media to do it are a lot more empowered now because of this technology than they were in the past. So the optimist in me says, well, the, you know, the barriers to entry are lower for propagandists and they can more easily hit their KPIs because they have all these amazing metrics. But again, something that we, we know from studying voters is that it's sort of a garbage in, garbage out thing. And, and if you're not really putting time and effort into persuading us, then the, the benefits are low, right? So I guess the, um, you know, again, and maybe it's a little bit Pollyanna-ish of me, but if it's not changing voters' minds, then why do we care? Yeah, I think what it's, one of the effects that it's really having is that 
it's not necessarily changing people's minds, but it's giving, first of all, um, a lot of ideas at the fringe of the political spectrum that people do hold. It's giving them a megaphone and it's making them seem a lot louder uh, than they actually are. And that loudness then allows other people that might share those political values to join on and to like bandwagon onto various cause. And so it's kind of connecting people at the fringes a lot more than in the past, because now they have a Facebook page or a group that they can join. Um, they have an audience on Twitter with various hashtags that they can use. Um, and so, yeah, not only like allowing these people to kind of come together at the fringes, but then amplifying that kind of back into the mainstream and then mainstream media um, and others will often pick up these narratives um, and share them. People will share them. You know, we kind of talked about this earlier because if something is kind of conspiratorial or room like a rumor, um, people like that kind of content. And so it's very much like a vicious cycle, I think. And so even though it might not necessarily be changing people's minds immediately, I think, you know, the slow day-to-day -day effects that seeing this kind of content over and over um, and increasingly having these fringe ideas amplified can slowly start to widen that divide between people. So I have a question in the chat that touches on that idea of how social media brings people together, but can also sort of drive a, a, um, a wedge, I guess, between different groups. And, and that gets us back again, I think, to this idea of effective polarization because in groups and out groups do matter. So the question is from Sandra and she asks, you know, what do you think about linking polarization in the long observed reduction in social cohesion or, or what we might call social capital in the sort of Putnam um, concept like conceptualization and bowling alone and how we're sort of you know we're atomizing as a society um in other words social media provides a platform for social cohesion when social cohesion expressed by active involvement in community groups has reduced or broken down but it also permits an intensity and focus because of the way that users are served content which is exactly the point that you were just making you know we'd be remiss to to talk about social media today and not you know, not touch on the fact that we're all here via Zoom, that Samantha's here from San Francisco, the rest of us are here from our lockdown houses in Australia. There is something about the social media, about social media and, and these platforms and the way that it does bring people together. Yeah, definitely. And I usually like to cite the Putnam article of Bowling Alone as, you know, we all do, reasons, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why we like to, you know, and also like thinking about these trends more broadly than just social media that, but, you know, polarization is something that has been happening before the internet and before mobile phones. Um, we've had these kinds of growing trends, um, but social media can amplify a lot of these um, features just because of its various affordances the way that it like networks people and can bring like-minded people together to opt into their groups. Okay, so you just mentioned affordances, which is something that I only really learned about in the last couple of years. And it's this idea that for some of us, social media is easy. You know, we, we have the skills, we have that we can jump online, we know how to download an app, we know how to um, to speak in the kind of way that, that social media, um, you know, fosters and, and that to, to enter debates online that, um, you know, that can create social capital or social cohesion. Can you touch on affordances and, and how they're sort of differently distributed um, across platforms and I guess how the different platforms sort of lend themselves to different types of, um, of social cohesion? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, so I'll take kind of like the three biggest ones, I think. Um, I'll do Twitter, uh, we can do Facebook, and we can do YouTube, and yeah, you know, we'll throw TikTok in there too, because <laughs> they kind of all overlap in, in various ways. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about like Twitter and social cohesion and affordances, the way that, for example, the news feed and hashtags are structured, um, people can join certain group conversations using various hashtags um, that organize topics and conversations pretty much that are happening on Twitter. 
together. And so that's one way that we tend to see some social cohesion happening. Because Twitter is very open and hashtags are very, like, can be read and viewed by everybody, um, I'd say that, you know, you don't have as, like, strong of an effect as you would say in, like, a private Facebook group where you're inviting members to join um, or you might get vetted before you can actually participate in this kind of group uh, chat on, on the Facebook groups. Um, whereas, you know, Twitter, any it's pretty open so anybody can, can join it. So you might have like some diverging opinions and things like that too. It's much more conversational and so on and so forth. Um, Facebook, when we're thinking about social cohesion and the way that it brings people together, what is unique about it, again, is this kind of group uh, feature or like even the pages as well. Um, pages are essentially run by one person that will push content to users. Um, and then groups are things that anybody can kind of participate in and people will join pages or groups uh, based on their interests. Um, you know, they can be, you know, about cats or they can be about politics, they can be about vaccines vaccine uh, misinformation, or they can be about climate disinformation. So there's all kinds of topics that people will join in and out of there. Um, there is TikTok is a really interesting platform because um, it's out the way I don't know how many people are on TikTok um, that are on this call, but um, it's kind of, you know, we t tend to think about TikTok as like one of the new forms for disinformation and all this kind of stuff, especially because it reaches a lot of younger generations. The content is very viral um, and it's not as it's kind of a new kid, new kid on the block. So they don't have a lot of the same kind of like practices um, that a lot of other social media companies have and capacity as well. Um, so we tend to think of this as being, you know, some of the new fronts. Um, and TikTok's algorithm will essentially, you know, you just scroll through constantly seeing a different videos. It's organized by hashtags the same way that uh, that Twitter is, but it's less kind of group groupy and more based on um, tailoring content to particular users. And so you kind of get social cohesion in the sense that you are targeted as being a person that you know might like dog content and therefore all you're going to get is dog content. Um, we actually see a lot of news organizations and even like state-backed media, um, like Russian state-backed media creating accounts on TikTok and creating this kind of um, fun video content that will introduce children or teens to like what's going on in Syria. Um, and so there can be like political angles and stuff like that on TikTok content as well. Um, so it's a very interesting, fascinating space. I'm kind of rambling right now, but the point oh, is that- <laughs> Fascinating and terrifying. Whenever I wander onto TikTok, it feels like the wild west. And so I'm, part of me feels like relieved that it's not just you know me approaching 40 but on the other hand that feels like it's you know like it's going to foment a lot of potential polarization in kids yeah I you know I think I was just like kind of scrolling through some of the channels like content earlier um and it's just so fascinating because it is kind of like very intro 101 fun content that's very much done in the way um, of other content that is appealing to younger generations uh very catchy um and you know it's 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 just really interesting how they're like framing a lot of this disinformation to newer generations and this is the stuff that will you know, when pe people are young, they're still forming their political identities in various ways. And so um, it's, it's just a fascinating phenomenon and something, an area that needs a lot more research. <laughs> well, this is great as the parent of a 14 year old. I'm, I'm not at all, uh, <laughs> not at all relieved by, by learning about this. Uh, and now I would be a very terrible employee if I didn't uh, read uh, my boss's uh, the vice chancellor is here. My boss's comments in the chat. Uh, Brian says that from his vantage point, the internet has disintermediated the curation of information and knowledge. 
Uh, so where we're kind of, we kind of act as the gatekeepers, you know, information provision is becoming a lot more democratic. Um, this is something that I'm reminded whenever I tweet out something completely stupid and Brian chimes in to gently ask if, if maybe I'm not correct. Um, and thank you, Brian, for keeping me on my toes. And, and that now the ecosystem, we have an ecosystem where information is ubiquitous and requires each, each citizen to make individual decisions about how they interact with it. How do we help citizens connect to information in a way that supports valid information and expertise? And no, I don't think you're being too elite for thinking this, Brian. I think what, what we find in a lot of media curation is that people are time poor. And anything that can help us parse information, particularly in this sort of ubiquitous information environment where we're drowning in information, anything that can help us to, to parse that and to sort the good from the bad is useful. And at the moment, that, that role is probably, well, at least on social media, is really passing from journalists and from editors and producers to platforms and, and, and algorithms. And that sounds very kind of... The, the robots are coming to get us, but is that the case, Sam? Or is you know, would you would you um, portray that differently? Yeah, um, for me, you know, I think um, I think some theories from psychology can help us a lot here when we think of the difference between like system one and system two processing, um, where I always get them backwards. System two is I should Google this. Let's just go slow and the fast. slower. Yeah, the, slow yeah fast. Let's go slow and fast. <laughs> I'm pretty sure system two is the slow one and system one is the fast one. Um, so when we're system one, when we're fast processing, we tend to not pay very much attention to the facts. We tend to have an emotional reaction to the content. And a lot of Facebook or social media content in general is really designed to feed into that system one processing. Again, because of attention economics, you know, it's the stuff that just elicits an emotional reaction from us. And so we tend to, you know, think with, make decisions about things based on how we feel about them. Uh, where a system two processing is this, or whatever the slower one is, the slow processing that we do, um, that's when we start to stop, take a second, think rationally about what we're seeing and process it and come to more logical decisions about what we're, what we're reading and how that re relates to us and our values. Um, and social media does not promote that kind of slow, um, engaging, rational kind of content because it's constantly just scroll more, 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 spend more time, read more things, watch more videos. Um, and so if we're thinking about solutions to get people to like be more rational about what they're consuming online, um, I think a lot of the solutions really get to um, tailoring content or giving people content that will um, force them to engage in this kind of like slower rational processing opposed to the quick emotional processing that happens. And so for me, really, it's not about slapping labels onto content because this is something that um, we see a lot of the platforms doing now. It's um, labeling mis and disinformation online, um, labeling election related content and linking you know, users to go to voting information centers, um, mm -hmm. labeling things as fact-checked. Um, a lot of the studies actually show that these kind of practices have a lot of unintended consequences um, and are not actually making people more rational readers of news. Um, instead, for me, the problem, again, really just comes down to the business model of these platforms and the ways that algorithms promote a lot of this fast thinking content, this emotional kind of content. If we can get out of that, um, then I think we're actually going to be able to see people be more critical in, in what they're reading online and help develop a lot of those skills um, that people need to navigate the wealth of information that now is made available to us. When you talk about the interventions, the kinds of, can, can you sort of elaborate on the kinds of things that, that you're talking about, the kinds of things that we could insert, I guess, into the platforms or into the ecosystem that might uh, reduce polarization or might um, stimulate sort of critical responses or what we call sort of cognitive reflection. Um, Andrew Podger in the chat has, has you know, asked about the sort of the viability 
of getting platforms to uh, to tell consumers how reliable the information is or, you know, the, the source of the information is um, something else that we talk about. So, you know, we talk about fact checking. Uh, we talk about these sorts of uh, cognitive reflection tests where you, you know, you every now and then you're sort of asked to reflect on what you've just read, um, things that break that kind of attention economic cycle. What can you just give us a quick overview of the different um, the different possible interventions and what we know about them so far? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, um, there's so many different kinds of interventions that platforms have introduced to combat a lot of these problems. So uh, you mentioned labeling, fact-checking initiatives. Um, we can talk about investments in news journalism. That's something that we've seen a lot mm -hmm. of the, the platforms do recently. Um, there have been some algorithmic changes to downgrade certain kinds of content over others. Um, if we, I guess we could start maybe with labeling, because um, that's kind of one of the big ones that I see a lot of platforms do, especially, you know, in the lead up to elections is introducing a lot of these election related labels um, and um, kind of related to this is like the third party fact checking because platforms will partner with third party fact checkers and then label content that has been reviewed by um, these third party fact checkers as being false or misleading or um, you know whatever the appropriate label is and so when we're thinking about um, labeling as a strategy to reduce mis and disinformation and therefore kind of combat polarization that way um, Labeling tends to have a lot of unintended consequences. Um, and so one of the, the studies on labeling has shown that if you label content, it tends to um, decrease people's overall trust in all news. So it's not just that we're making people critical readers of news from maybe fringe or far right or far left websites, but we're actually making people skeptical of professional news as well. Um, and so that might not necessarily be good either because you know we want people to have high trust in um, professional media and professional journalism uh, to an extent. Um, labeling can also, um, if everything is labeled, but a piece of mis or disinformation makes it through unlabeled, um, that can also have mm -hmm. a negative consequence because people, it's called, um, researchers who did the study call it the implied truth effect, where content that is false but unlabeled is sort of trusted as being true. And so if platforms just mislabel something, they miss a piece of content that's going through their automated filters, um, people might interpret that mis or disinformation as actually being true because it's not labeled. Um, the one area where labeling does help is that um, if users are given a prompt that something has been like fact checked as false um, or as misleading, they might not actually share it. Um, and so that's one of the positive sides okay. of, of these labeling kind of studies is that we can actually reduce the amount of sharing of mis and disinformation by labeling content. But you know, we have to kind of think about some of these unintended consequences as well uh, when it comes to the, the labeling practices. Um, and, you know, and so I think, you know, fact checking kind of goes in hand in hand with a lot of those responses. For me, I think the most promising um, things that we've seen platforms do um, and do relatively well that I think, you know, they could do more of um, has to do with like investments in news and journalism. Um, for example, removing paywalls for people who want to access local news. Um, I think that's a really great um, initiative because, you know, one thing about the internet too is that it's made information free and mm -hmm. nobody wants to pay for uh, news anymore if you can just find something else online for free. Um, but newsrooms uh, need that kind of subscription. They need that paywall to help fund a lot of their work. We can't just completely cut off 
their modes of financing, right? And so by platforms kind of covering the paywalls or like the, the some of the um, paywall costs for users to access that content, that's something that is positive and can help educate users because now they're not going to, if they click on an article that they want to read, they don't have to worry about the paywall anymore. They can actually just read and access that professional produced information. Um, the other area that I think they can do more in, again, has to do with the, the algorithms because um, they've, you know, made several attempts at, you know, tweaking their algorithms to maybe not share as much political content in news feeds in the lead up to elections. But then, you know, the question is, how do you define political? And mm -hmm. I, there's just so much stuff kind of around the, you know, the way that this negative viral content uh, tends to spread that I think platforms really need to do more in, but they're just disincentivized not to because it's their business model. Thank you so much, Samantha, for, for being here. Uh, thank you for coming, you know, uh, for our breakfast and your pre-dinner. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who's attended. Thank you to the Crawford School and to the ANU for putting this on. Um, if you have any more questions that you want to ask, um, Samantha, I'm sure you can uh, yeah, get in touch with her either on Twitter or via email, uh, stalk her on Facebook. Um, don't stalk her on Facebook. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, um, I don't know why you would, but I'm very easy to find. Um, we will let everyone go and have their breakfast now. Thank you so much. And we'll see you for the final panels in the Leadership Forum this morning. <laughs>